Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here at four o'clock. Four o'clock rock. Think Tech now. Think Tech live. Think Tech forever. And Think Tech Solomon Enos. Yeah, Solomon, say hi. Aloha. <laughs> now, who is Solomon? We have we have Ruby Menon here, and she's going to tell us. She's going to introduce us about Solomon because this is all about TEDx Honolulu, and yeah. she's going to connect that up so we know what we're dealing with. Well, let me start out first by talking to you about TEDx Honolulu. And it's actually going to be happening on July 9th, which is this coming Saturday, so in a couple of days. And we have a jam-packed event for you guys. Uh, we have uh, Solomon, who's going to be speaking, but he is also our artist in residence. And what that means is that he actually created all of the artwork for the entire event. And this year, instead of just doing like, you know, these random installations um, that other artists perhaps have done, what he did is he customized drawings for each of the artists. And uh, that will be shown and reflected in each of their presentations. And um, as an artist in residence for TEDx, this is a new concept that we just implemented this, uh, this is the second year. And as an artist in residence, um, we bring in an artist from the local community so that we can highlight and showcase their artwork, uh, what they're all about. They participate in the TEDx event as a speaker as well. So let me tell you a little bit about Solomon. If you don't already know him, he's quite a uh, respected artist and personality in our local community. And don't be shy, Solomon. <laughs> Solomon is not shy. No, really. he's not. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so he's a native Hawaiian artist, educator, illustrator, and visionary. And I can attest to that because I'm the artist in residence curator, and I've had the pleasure of working with Solomon, and it's been a real delight learning about you and your artwork and how you go about putting your art together so it's been a treat for me to just be on the other end of that so thank, thank you. you for that um, and so he expresses artistic viewpoint in a wide variety of media including oil paintings book illustrations outdoor murals both painted and in glass mosaic and mixed media sculptures now you've probably seen a lot of Solomon's work in murals around Kaka'ako uh, he's participated in Powwow Hawaii and so even though you may not know who you know, the artist and what he looks like, you've definitely seen his artwork. Um, he considers himself an intelligent optimist, and his art explores an aspirational vision of the world at its best, which at times comes through in polyfantastic science fiction narratives. His work touches on themes of ancestry and identity, the human relationship with the earth, and the future of Hawaii, its people, and its resources. He's exhibited in the biennial X Honolulu Museum of Art, 6th Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art in Queensland at the Queensland Art Gallery, uh, contact art exhibitions and others. His work is held in private collections and in the public collection of the Hawaii State Art Museum. You can also see his art murals in Kaka'ako through his particip participation with Powwow Hawaii. And he is our TEDx Honolulu artist in residence. So welcome, Solomon. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's talk about the real Solomon. <laughs> 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 so how'd you get into art? Well, um, thank you so much, first of all, this opportunity to come and uh, share a little bit of uh, my story. And uh, before I talk a little bit about my origins, I think, importantly, Every human on Earth has a really important story to tell. And this is just my turn. And um, I just happen to have a lot of turns. So eventually, <laughs> I'll, eventually I'll, hand over, I'll hand over the microphone one day. Um, but I'm so blessed with every opportunity to share a little bit of what I perceived uh, growing up. And I, I was blessed from a very young age with um, direct access to wonder and purpose. Um, what gave you that? And it was growing up in an environment out on the west side of the islands and growing up with my father and my parents who helped to open up the Ka'ala Cultural Learning Center where we worked with adults and kids that got kicked out of every other pro program and watched as they rebooted who they were by healing the land, uncovering two, three, four hundred year old um, agricultural, agricultural terraces you know, and with that sweat and with the tears and with the groaning and complaining, transforming over time with the water entering into these terraces, transforming it into food 
transforming it into pride. And that I thought, oh, hmm, I think that is a kind of an algorithm that can be applied globally as a way of rebooting global narratives. Because you can heal the body, you can heal the mind, you can heal the soul. But if the stories um, continue to persist, that, you know, the programming that we either reprogram ourselves or reprogram our communities, that we always will kill each other. There will always be war. People will always cheat. You know, if we keep front-loading those programs, well, gosh, this is what we get. So the nature of storytelling, the power of storytelling is really what inspired me from a very young age the closest thing to me was art. <laughs> the closest tool, it, it, um, had it been a trombone, it would have been a trombone. But ultimately, it would have been, you know, a really... If, if it was a trombone, you would have brought it here today. I would have had it today, yeah. 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 <laughs> I would have had a different hairdo, probably, too. Um, but I definitely see that um, art is... I think the word art is kind of fails, really. It is magic. And artists are the modern-day shamans. When did you find out you had a talent in art? You know, I think it was um, when the the res it was in the resonance of my grandfather's voice when he sat down and he would he would lay out. I mean, it's no surprise that I do art. I mean, like I have had all the best conditions. You know, I've had purpose and you know I've had direction. I've had you know unconditional love. If I could name one of my superpowers, it was un and is unconditional love for my family. Um, <laughs> And my grandfather providing art supplies and tools, and then he would say, oh, boy, he had fought in the Solomon Islands in the World War II. And so he, Is that how you got your name? And, and not indirectly, indirectly. <laughs> I don't think it was, but it was interesting. But, but he, he never wanted to talk about the war. He never wanted to ever mention what he had done there. But, he, but he, he, just really, he just really poured what beauty he, he got from life into his children and his grandchildren. And he, the sound of his voice, when he would lay out his, the art supplies for me and say, oh, boy, I can never really draw, but your drawings are so beautiful. And when I would draw and paint, this, this, he would make this sound like a ooh and hmm. I think, what a primal sound. I, I, I think you had those sounds echoing in the caves in France when those first bits of charcoal were going down, a ooh and ah. So it's tapping into that and, and knowing that art is magic, art is sorcery and that the role of art and the role of storytelling is so important uh, here in Hawaii. And, you know, really, it's a meta-narrative for all indigenous cultures, all storytelling traditions. What about me? Can I tell a story? Oh, my goodness. Can, every, I, can I learn? Every, uh, every, was it, uh, every Thursday at 4 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what's the difference between a lecturer and a storyteller? That's it's got to be a big difference. Yeah. No? Yep. And it's like one you, <laughs> another one you go, wow. Right? Both of it is information. Mm -hmm. Both of it is information. And it's yeah. really, there's fun little paradigm shifts that I see so often that can toggle one way or the other. It can make huge differences. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Okay, so <laughs> reboot. This is about yes. reboot. Yes. And so you take the art and you express the story through the art in the hopes that it will help not only Hawaii, but everywhere, yes. humanity in general, mm -hmm. reboot. Yeah. Okay, what, what's that like? What, what happens after we successfully reboot? Oh, great. Well, first and foremost, I think um, I love to explore precedence. And sometimes, though, precedence comes in the form of fantastic science fiction. Um, just the uh, finished chapter House Dune uh, audiobook, of course, so I can draw and listen at the oh, same great. time. Oh, sure. great, that's great. The, I think the it only real true to multitasking is to yeah. actually draw or to paint or create <laughs> visually and yeah. to listen to, yeah. you know, either with, whether it was stories around a fire or whether it's an MP3, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but perfect. But, um, but basically, um, I actually want to back it up even a little bit further. Polyphantastica was inspired by Dune and my love for Tolkien and, and Vonnegut and Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and uh, uh, Octavia Butler and Ursula Le Guin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because they're splints for reality. When reality seems broken, you need something that parallels reality, but it's not quite reality. You need not another bone, I guess you could use another bone, but you need something that runs parallel to reality to help us to realign 
to readdress, wait, are we on the right path? Is my arm supposed to be hanging like this? I've just gotten used to it. Like, no, we'll actually, <laughs> ow, you know, maybe we really do need to realign. And so, you know, if you think about things like, uh, uh, so, um, Polyphantastica is a 40,000 year timeline. And each year is a single book cover. And it's uh, in conceptual phase now. It's just a, um, I have, it's in different, it's been in different versions for about 15 years or so. It's been, I've been working on it for a long time. But Betis, basically, because it's a 40,000 year timeline, um, you, you begin to see pattern, you patterns within societies. Um, you know, the good guys become the bad guys, and the bad guys become the good guys, and the good guys become the bad guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you begin to distill from all of that this reoccurring human narrative that um, if you don't understand the nature of human consciousness, you're doomed. You can get a bunch of people onto a spaceship, and traveling to Mars, no problem, which is what Brian's going to be talking a little bit, one of our TEDx mm -hmm. speakers, a little plug, side, side way back into TED again. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end, when you get to Mars and it opens up and you just have one crazy guy with a knife comes crawling out, you know, because he's killed everybody on board. So what's the point of building these spaceships if humans don't know how to love each other? And so returning to that core understanding is the reason so why. So this is reflected here. Yes. So this absolutely. Is, this is, you're talking this. This is, this is a picture of the words you're using. This absolutely. is an expression of your a whole platform mm -hmm. on the subject. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it is upside down, but that's groovy because up and down is relative in the cosmos. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and your yeah. eyes actually invert Maybe anything. Maybe this is right side up. Yeah. I'm <laughs> upside down. Yeah. There you go. Our eyes turn up, everything upside down anyway, so up and down again. But, but, but what I'm going to be talking about it is... It is Hieronymus Bosch. Yes. It's totally. that, this, this is... It's all Bosch. Did you intend it to be that way? Yes. Because <laughs> okay. Um, my dad brought home all these books from... He had graduated from the University of Hawaii with a master's in fine arts in like the late 60s. So ah, he had talent too then. So, and, and he had one... He had definitely had a, and a lot of art books. And so I crawled into his art. I think mm -hmm. at 11 I said... No, no, I think it was at 8 I said, Paul Clay. Paul Clay, that's it. Paul Clay and only Paul Clay. I wrote a paper about Paul Clay. Did you? I did, went oh. back in college. Wow. He's my favorite guy, Paul Clay. You yeah. know, Can who, we, oh, who, go on the street, go on Bishop Street and Absolutely. ask them, who is Paul Clay? Absolutely. And they'll say, after talk to Solomon, he knows about that. Absolutely. Paul, <laughs> but you know what, what I love about Paul Clay is because it, it, it looks like copper design. You know, and even the, the way that he would work his material, almost like it looks like a fabric before bringing these intercepting, oh. Uh, I'm going to go off on Paul's tangent, so I better stop there. No, but <laughs> can, can you describe, describe to me, just before we have a break here in a little while, what, how do you see your art compared to other art that you know? Oh, um, I, I see myself as one weaver, uh, and we're all, all artists, all people that create media, are all weaving a single fabric. And the threads we choose to weave into that loom, into that fabric, it's a collective. So um, I guess I see myself maybe helping to bring um, a little bit, some certain kinds of thread that are both resilient and pretty. <laughs> because most of the other threads are made out of Cheetos, right? And artificial materials. You and knew that, didn't you, Ruby? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, not to say that mine are any better than Cheetos, but, but, but the idea is that there's the, the, it is about how do we cleanse the mainstream, yeah? We know water, yeah? And whether it's you know how we use looking towards news or television for truth, you know. Oh yes, of course. The truth, you know, but you know whether we you know the idea of like you know how much truth. It's sort of like um, how many drops of gasoline do you want in your drinking water, right? Of water. Like, do you want three drops, or do you want no drops at all? And like, I want no lies. You got one my, drop. People only got ten. Yeah, drops. people are just. Uh, Everybody has a different number. You know, they're like, it's not enough. I need to add it. Oh, that's. Truth, right? Oh yeah. So you know, really, and, I, and that's why you know many other people are doing this. The idea of truthy truths, how to gauge truth, how to discern truth, how to make a dashboard for reality that talks about what is the true shape of our morality. When I buy something, I want to know. Like one of those things where you put a coin and it goes zoom, 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 and you watch where your coin goes. Yeah. What if for every spent penny I spend on Amazon, you saw this huge web of where your money went, um. who it's supporting? You know, because it's getting back to a very simple idea. Um, you know, it might, it, it's about, not about how much money you have. Yeah, that's a single number. It's about where did you get that money from? 
where is it going after, you know? Um, what did you do to get it? What did you do to get it, right? <laughs> and unless corporations and entities who have money to abuse, unless they tell us that, we just won't give them any of it, yeah. you see? And once you have a critical mass of the population aware that, oh my God, wait, 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 no, no, no. I'm the, I hold the strings. <laughs> the problem has been up there manipulating us. And so how do we turn it back around? Um, now, importantly, change is going to have to happen, and this is really important, and I think in an Aesopian way. And that's why these pieces are indirect ways of actually making fun of power. Oh, it, there's a bit of Mel Brooks in that, too. They do make fun. There's they humor do. here. There's humor. Yeah. It's totally is they're, what it is. They're showing basically that to have too much money is akin to being bloated and sick. And that there will be a time when, you know, humanity will lead the markets as opposed to the other way around. We're going to have to reinvent ourselves, mm -hmm. though. You're helping us do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm, 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 I'm just making trouble. I'm making noise, and hopefully something sticks. And <laughs> okay. you made a beautiful game also. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take thing. a short break now so we can sort of catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's Solomon Enos, artiste extraordinaire and heavily involved in TEDx Honolulu. Oh, we'll you. be right back. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy and You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Aloha. Join us at TEDx Honolulu 2016. It's at the Blaisdell, July 9th. From 10 to 5, the discount code is R-A-C-H-A-E-L underscore T-E-D-X-H-N-L. See you then. And bingo, we're back. Are you happy? I'm happy to be back. And Solomon Enos is happy. And Ruby Menon is happy. Yeah. Ruby, we're going to talk about TEDx now. Mm -hmm. What is a TEDx speech, actually? So TEDx really focuses on the, the, the whole uh, part of the uh, promo, I guess, is like the, an idea worth spreading. So when somebody is selected to come in as a TEDx speaker, they uh, have pitched an idea that is either unique or it's something that makes people think or maybe changes hearts and minds. And so uh, TEDx speakers uh, are of that type of, uh, you know, they come from that, that cloth, maybe. They're cut from okay, that cloth. Okay. How long is the speech? It tends to be anywhere from 12 to 18 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, you People know, stand. fairly, they and stand they stand, up, yeah. yeah, and it's a very specific format. Are the graphics involved or just the speech? Uh, no, they can actually have presentation graphics behind mm -hmm. them. I've got some ideas for you, actually, Solomon. <laughs> yeah, and so Solomon actually has not only see our artists in residence, but he will also be a speaker. And part of what he has designed for his talk are to show some of his drawings mm -hmm. and this fantastic game concept that he's been working on, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So now, you know, this is really, this is like a scoop. Great. Because I know, I know you are going to give one hell of a speech. Oh. I know that, I know that. <laughs> but, and we've seen, you know, we've sort of seen the boundaries of, well, there are no boundaries, seen the essence of you a little bit anyway here today. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to know what you have in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, they say in a speech like TEDx, you prepare by just thinking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You sort of organize the little gray matter in straight lines, yep. or maybe not so, mm -hmm. and, and, you, and then it all comes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what's going to come out, Solomon? Oh, boy. Well, um, something that I will be completely open sourced and that if I'm successful somebody else will take and go and do fabulous things with um, because whatever I do you know whether it's TEDx or anything else I think it's a being open source is so important because I think there are a lot of ideas that need to happen and so first and foremost I think any fear that anything that I share would be would, would, you know would have any kind of proprietary label to it, like, oh, 
if there's anything that comes out of my mouth that is useful, that is a tool that anybody can, you know, go with it, run with it, but you must share it. You must share it. It's your share. obligation. That's it. That's all. Yeah. You don't even need to. You don't even need to credit me. Just share it. Yeah. 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 Easy. There you that go. Goes so. beyond, <laughs> it goes beyond. It goes beyond public domain. Yeah. Right. So it's I want to get that obligation to pass it exactly. on. Exactly. So that I just want to get out immediately, right out of the way, because um, because in a way, I think I've already transcended. You know, I think I'm more of a concept than a than a being. <laughs> you know, and I'm grooving with that. I'm happy. With that. I mean, that's why I mean. You know, <laughs> solitary confinement with lots of pencils and paper is not a problem. No, I'm just kidding. I shouldn't say that. I just say oh, that. No, <laughs> no, no, not going to work. Not going to work. No. Um, no. But it really is. I mean, I really have found for myself, you know, a way to actually crawl into my own personal universe and be completely content. And I want people to gain access to that. How much of that can you share in 18 minutes? Well, uh, I can share the key. I can share the... I can point... I could perhaps direct people to the door. <laughs> the door to the, to the labyrinth. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but I think, so, to, to actually, to, so, um, of all the different things I did want to talk about, it really was coming back to, so, to something that I actually learned from that 40,000 year narrative, Polyfantastica. It's almost like if you, got a, you write a book or you have a dream, um, something comes uh, through you, through this medium, book, dream, song or something, and you go, wow, wait, wait a second. I can, you wake up out of this dream, and you say, well, what if I apply this to reality? Mm. Simply put, you have a way for, um, to begin the process of all of humanity be becoming a collective consciousness. Not a new idea. At the same time, though, still maintaining our individualism, okay? And in a way, we kind of do that already. We have, you know, uh, World of Warcraft and all kinds of vi digital media video games that are, you know, <laughs> basically people, you know, becoming collective zeros and ones while still being independent individuals. And so we're moving ourselves towards, in a very clumsy way, though, towards that kind of um, collective uh, awareness. You like the progress, or is the progress uh, missing something? Progress, well, so if you, to use the internet for an example, the internet is kind of like this amazing spring of water, and humanity is this filthy rag that we have to keep wringing out and squeezing out, and it's all filthy. It's going to take another decade or two. You heard it here on <laughs> you know? with the rag. You heard that. You know, but eventually a, it, an, an anonymous nobility will rise up, and for the next thousand million years will be the norm. And that, I mean, and by saying so, it becomes more so. Yeah. See, but that's is the, it one person saying it or everybody saying it? Everybody. See, Anyone has to say absolutely. It, yeah. if you ask a single cell within the human body and you ask, are you an individual or are you collective? It would say, ooh, both. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so it's managing the needs of the me and the needs of the everybody is what, it's a meta narrative. What human beings have seemed to keep stumbling over, over and over and over again. So, which is why I think. What I'm hoping to do is um, create um, w an example of something, and it may never take, take root. Um, it may never even make sense for a couple generations, but uh, I th it's a groovy seed, and I like to plant it. You know? And it's basically finding a way to map all of our monetary systems that allows us to figure out how our money is tied to our uh, morality globally, always. And I think that, and then, you know, what's really important is looking at the nature of games. Way, you know, people, you know, engage games and it's like... Why, why, why? Well, why games? Why are they important? Well, when you walk into a room, that's what most kids are doing. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, though, the root of games, games at its very core is our, our collaborative storytelling. Mm. My three queens are definitely going to trump this, you know, are going to enter into this kingdom, all right? And these three queens were the boss until one day, right? So every interaction, so, and, and that to survive the long voyages into space, we're going to need some amazing board games. And not only board games, but the ability to make billions of board games, one after the other, to survive the 300,000 year trip. So your message, the, <laughs> the opening of your, your, your thought process, your yeah. soul, your yeah. this creative... Hieronymous Bosch ideas, yes. you know, as reflected in the, I hope you can get a shot of this, it's so good. Wait, where is it? The light doesn't, okay, there it is, yeah. It's amazing. Anyway, 
you're going to share that yep. uh, on what's the day of the oh, TEDx? Actually, actually, so it's on it's yeah. on July 9th, and I wanted to July make sure that... July 9th is right around the door. Did yeah, you realize it's, that? It's on yeah. Saturday. It's like and Saturday. people, yep. uh, I forgot to tell you guys, flash sale. We have a limited number of tickets that are for $40. And this is, uh, we were able to uh, work with Namea Hawaii, and they were so gracious to actually sponsor a bank of tickets for us so that they could subsidize, help us subsidize some of the cost. And uh, there's a limited number of tickets, so you've got to go to the TEDx Honolulu website, www.tedxhonolulu.org, and click on publish, uh, purchase tickets, and then put in that code that you see on the screen, Namea Hawaii, and that will give you $40 uh, uh, discount, so from $80, actually your ticket will only cost $40. And we want to thank Miley Meyer from Namea, Hawaii, for graciously sponsoring this bank of tickets to give you guys the opportunity to come and hear Solomon and yeah. many other oh, great Solomon. speakers. I'll be there, Solomon, with my camera. We're going we're gonna to take, take your picture. Hope that's okay, huh? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, I'm completely I'm open source. And I want to <laughs> close the show here. We're kind of at the end. And I wonder if you can just give me an answer to my question, my perennial pilgrim question. It's a small question, and maybe in the next 30 seconds you can answer sure. it, okay? Solomon Enos, what is life? Oh, um, life is the story and the storyteller at once. Whoa! Wow! Whoa! You're fabulous! That's, that's <laughs> what fun you are! NPR! <laughs> I can take on to it! That's Solomon Enos! Come see hero. Solomon at TEDx on July 9th, Saturday! <laughs> and that's Ruby Be there, Square! <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. This was crackajack good. <laughs> Close up! <laughs>